Hi, this is Filiberto Amati, and I'm here today with uh, Marco Bemolo, and we have uh, two esteemed guests for our next episode on the future of design and design thinking, and Marco is going to introduce them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, thrilled to have uh, Julio Mario Tino, uh, who is a Guggenheim Fellow and uh, uh, Dean uh, at the Northwestern University. Uh, but most importantly, today is here uh, as co-author of uh, the Nexus, uh, a new book uh, uh, that he brought uh, with uh, uh, my dear friend. I hope uh, you uh, share the feelings uh, and uh, uh, design legend uh, uh, Bruce Mao. So actually, we are here today to... Uh, have an informal conversation uh, about uh, the book, uh, the content of the book, the design of the book, uh, and what the book tells us uh, about uh, uh, a better future. So um, I would like to start uh, uh, with, uh, with a, a question uh, that is uh, actually very basic, but uh, very crucial. Um, you uh, mentioned somewhere that you worked on this book uh, across uh, several years uh, of conversations, uh, of uh, uh, exchange. Um, what is that uh, ultimately uh, triggered the need to put all of your conversations uh, into a quite uh, remarkable uh, and uh, uh, quite uh, um, uh, substantial uh, publication like this, where there is an academic side, uh, a design side, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a very strong message. What is the, the motivation? What is the, the spark? I, I would say there was no spark. I mean, we, Bruce and I connected shortly after he did the massive change show in Chicago. Um, I mean, there were some crucial points in the conversation. I think one point initially was a little table where I put art, technology, and science and compare them in different categories. That was one. Um, somewhere in the middle, of those 10, 12 years, Bruce uh, showed to me the three issues of transformation find uh, Harry Holtzman. That was also crucial. At some point, the lessons of the book became important, but the conversations were frequent, but we never sort of discussed publisher or anything like that. And then maybe because I thought I was running out of time, at the end of 2019, I decided to assemble the notes we had. And this was over Christmas. And by about end of February, I had something semi-decent, kept working. just to have a test on how decent the notes were. Um, I approached a couple of publishers and once one said, yeah, we're interested in this. I, I told Bruce, I think it's the time to do it now. And then the pandemic and the lockdown started. And that's when basically for us, it was, we were all, at, at home, uh, we live more, maybe 150 yards apart, but it was all by Zoom. We had lots of meetings every week. Uh, and at some point, we formalized a relationship with MIT Press, but there was no trigger. As I said, it, it was providential that at the end of 2019, we assemble, I assembled the notes. And the trick was, and I will let Bruce comment on this, 
for everything that we included in the book, especially with images, there were probably two other images that were not included. Uh, in fact, I showed recently to someone who was interested more in design, an earlier version and this version, and I would say maybe 20% of the images in the book were in that previous version. Yeah. Uh, so no, it was a lot of accumulation, lots of conversations, um, which made the, the design easy because we knew exactly what we both like and yeah but it was no people ask about disagreement i don't think we ever had one no, no, no. no. well actually 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 um with, with bruce uh, it's total nonsense to speak of the design of the book and the content of the book because uh, since his collaboration with uh, rem uh -huh. colas uh, i think uh, the design and paolo antonelli in the movie Mao by uh, Jono and Benjamin Bergman uh, uh, really demonstrates plastically uh, how the, 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 the typography becomes an accumulation and uh, meaning uh, itself. But I have to say, Bruce, and uh, please contradict me and uh, shoot me if I'm wrong. Um, if I look uh, uh, to the Nexus compared to uh, M Mao MC24 or uh, Massive Change. Uh, I think uh, uh, this book to me looks a little bit like uh, uh, as a book designer, you have been going back to some of your earlier work uh, with zone books. Uh, uh, there, uh -huh. there is a different, uh, a different approach. Uh, there is a more, uh, um, I, 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 I I would say almost minimalistic approach to the actual book design. How, how do you, how do you see it uh, in your uh, in your um, in your trajectory as a, as a book designer? So it's actually a, a bit of a peculiar question, maybe. Um, no, no, that's a. Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, I think at one point I realized this may be the best book design that I've done. Um, in the sense that um, the synthesis for Julio and I was really deep. And, you know, Julio mentioned the, the kind of diagram, the chart that he made early on. Um, and, you know, I have been doing Nexus my whole life, trying to, uh, you know, I started, you know, when I was in high school, I was intending to be a scientist. Uh, and kind of at the last moment became an artist and uh, and studied art. Um, and so it's it's really always been kind of part of my you know mind and my language and my imagination to kind of bring these worlds uh, together, but I'd never named it as such. Um, and when Julio showed me the little chart, I was so blown away because what he had done was to look at the three domains of art, technology, and science, um, and 23 dimensions, you know, 23 different, um, it wasn't so complete then, but it was you know, that going that way, looking at all the different dimensions of the domains to understand uh, how they are different, how they're the same, how, you know, what, what are the kind of, uh, what happens, what operates, what's the operating system within each of the domains, uh, and what's the language that you need to, to kind of develop to uh, be able to synthesize those worlds? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, this book is really a book where the subject of the book is really the practice of my life and, um, and my you know, creative uh, design practice. Um, and so the synthesis, I think, was really quite um, you know, something quite special. Um, and in some ways more than any other book that I've ever worked on because it was itself the subject of the work. And, um, and so for me, the collaboration was, as Julio said, uh, super easy. It was, you know, 10 years of coffee uh, and three years of Zooms <laughs> and yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Uh, and it was uh, really one of the great intellectual adventures of my life. I mean, Julio is a very 
you know, he's he's quite modest, but he's a very special uh, um, intelligence and very special talent. Um, you know, being a painter and a scientist, you know, being someone who actually um, is a nexus person, um, he really understands what that means. And we had collaborated earlier on um, a, a practice at Northwestern uh, that he called whole brain engineering. Uh, it was really introducing, uh, in some ways, a kind of early nexus model to say, look, you know, we need, we not only need quantitative excellence, uh, we need qualitative excellence too. Uh, you know, we we need the whole brain to to do the best possible work, uh, yeah. and it really, I think, was quite um, you know quite uh, radical uh, to introduce that. Um, actually, uh, one of the concepts that you present uh, in the book is that of uh, the blur, blurification, uh, and that's a concept that Filiberto and I found uh, in our research, in our practice as well from another side. We did, Before you uh, go there, Marco, because the, yes, the two, no, you guys never disagree. I always disagree with Marco. It's probably because <laughs> we are from this di different, uh, you know, sides of Italy, different countries it's, of uh, Italy. It's probably. also quite rare that uh, that uh, uh, there are two guys from Torino, as in this case, uh, to, yeah, yeah. to battle him. <laughs> One, it's already enough yeah. for me usually. So, but anyway, <laughs> no. I before we we discuss about the blue. Uh, uh, I really like the origin story because it feels very natural. No, it's like you plant a seed, and then uh, you know, little by little, it grows. And you nurture it. Of course, you need to water it, and then uh, there wasn't a decision. Ah, let's let's do this together, or there wasn't a lot of control. Feels very uh, you know natural in that sense. But what is Nexus, what does it mean? Why Nexus? Of course. Before we go and talk to the blur. Can you explain that to me? <laughs> so and to, and the, to, to the, our the, viewers. No, no, no. The the next the nexus is to me the place where the people who are part of that, the nexus, have simultaneously the ability to look at things with one, with more than one pair of glasses, okay? So we, people go to university and get trained. You go to the law school to learn how to think like a lawyer. Uh, you go to medical school to think how to think like a doctor in different specialties. And economics, the same way. These economists learn a language which they never have to explain to anybody because you live within that circle of economists or lawyers. So the question is, if you are in one of those domains and you are faced with issues that require creative thinking, most of the ideas that will emerge will emerge as things that were kind of already existing in that domain, okay? What if somehow you could acquire a second pair of glasses that will allow you to see reality in two ways at the same time, okay? And they know recipe to do this. You have to have the desire of doing it. But the idea is that if you could look at things with the eyes of a scientist and with the eyes of an artist at the same time, being in this space that we call the nexus, uh, you will have a much richer set of possible ideas. The thinking space will increase. The downside may be that some of the ideas that will come to you will be kind of diametrically opposed. Uh, but the ability of, we, we say that that's also good because the ability of handling contradictions, 
I mean, if you never have to handle contradictions in your life, I think you probably had a very narrow lens. <laughs> you see everything with one lens, and there are lots of examples in the world of single lens viewing of things. So the nexus is the place where these modes of thinking coexist, at least in the minds of individuals. But we make the point that this also applies to teams. There could be nexus teams. A, a nexus team probably in order to function has to have some connective tissue there that are probably these nexus thinking people. But the team itself could be something that operates in this enriched space that we call the nexus. Sorry, the explanation is kind of long, but that's that's the that's my view of it. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. Bruce has a shorter one. Well, I have a, a I have a um, I have a a kind of purpose for the nexus, which is that the challenges we now face don't fit so neatly into the classical categories. They are really higher order complexity challenges, and therefore they really need the nexus perspective. They need a way, you know, we need a way of looking at them in new ways. Because imagining that you're going to uh, solve these new problems with the old categories uh, is not really plausible. So, you know, and that's what we really saw when we did massive change. And so when Julio began talking about the nexus and the synthesis, for me, it was very natural to say, of course, that's where we have to go. That's, that's you know, that's what we're going to need if we're going to be successful in this new world. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, before going to the, now I will say it, uh, before going to the blur, <laughs> because before touching on the blur, uh, you mentioned the Nexus team. And in the book, uh, uh, and also in the recent interview uh, with Fast Company, uh, you speak of a Renaissance team as opposite to a Renaissance man. In this book, there is a lot about Italian Renaissance. There is a lot about uh, Florence, yeah, Brunelleschi, yeah. and uh, Leon Battista Alberti. I wanted to ask you uh, what would be the ideal Renaissance team uh, in your perspective, and why is a Renaissance man not feasible uh, any longer as you uh, as you. Uh, eloquently articulate in the book uh, and with uh, with other interviews. So I, I let Bruce handle that, but let me just give you one framing concept about there is no way now that, for example, you could talk about a complete mathematician. The last one that fit that category, and we talk about him in the book was Jules Henry Poincaré, he was the last complete mathematician, the last universalist. In the same way that there is no, it's not possible to have a complete mathematician, in many other areas, you cannot have a complete anything. It, it, physics is too broad to have one complete physicist. And so uh, our, expectations for what completeness is as something embodied in an individual have to be kind of scaled down a little bit. But that doesn't mean that you cannot expand the concept to a team that has all the components. Yeah, and that's really where the Renaissance team uh, comes from. Uh, it was first named by Bill Buxton um, who became our chief scientist in our studio. Uh, even though I really didn't have a job for chief scientist, he declared that he was our chief scientist. Um, and he began showing up and helping us uh, when we were working on massive change. And he said, you know, Bruce, what you're really doing here uh, is a Renaissance team. You can't have a Renaissance person anymore because the scale of the knowledge is so great but you can assemble a Renaissance team. You could put together a group of people who together really embody that uh, special experience of the Renaissance and who, who together bring, bring the talent and the knowledge and the sensibility of, of that. But you need to understand what that means and you need to understand 
how to be a, a team player, you know, how to, what it means to, um, to contribute at that level. And it takes a special kind of uh, sensibility and talent, but also skill uh, to do it. And really that's what we uh, explore in the book, try to understand, you know, what does it take to work in this new way? What are the lessons we can learn? Um, and therefore the skills we can develop. Do you want to talk about the plur? <laughs> the plur now, Michael? <laughs> yes, we, now we can talk about the plur. Now we, uh, we actually, I was uh, really triggered because uh, Filiberto and I did a study about um, um, the impact or uh, future uh, uh, developments derived uh, um, from uh, the, the, the digitalization in essence. And we started with the hypothesis that uh, due to the dig digitalization, uh, you don't have leisure time and work time. You have a, a continuum because mm -hmm. you can sit, uh, um, you can sit uh, in your bedroom at midnight, exchanging uh, uh, emails about a contract with another uh, continent, uh, or you can be uh, at your office and book your holidays uh, on your mobile. So uh, we explored these uh, with uh, uh, 23, if I remember well, mm -hmm. uh, ah. people from industry design. And this was uh, 2017. We had Paolo Pininfarina of Pininfarina. We had um, people from uh, fast moving consumer goods, pharmaceutics, and we brought uh, a kind of white paper. Then we converted this uh, white paper into a peer-reviewed paper uh, for World Leisure Journal in 2020. And we brought along uh, some insights from the pandemics because of course, during the pandemics, the blurring of uh, physical spaces and digital spaces became uh, uh, radically uh, fast and, uh, and extreme. Uh, it was just... Uh, for me, a coincidence to see that you also in the Nexus uh, uh, propose the, the notion of the blur. Eh? And of course you propose it from a different angle. So I wanted to, uh, to, to ask you, what's your uh, view on the blur blurring? Uh, and uh, what do you think uh, this uh, says about uh, the future? By, by the way, can I comment something before you, you also mentioned 23? <laughs> so this, you know, the 23 pair of chromosomes that humans have. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's remarkable that we have 23 accidentally. We can pretend yeah, otherwise. Yeah, yeah it's totally, totally accidentally. It was, <laughs> it was a summer. I remember some interviews I, I went uh, to perform uh, in summer suits that were like uh, completely coming uh, coming from a steam room at the end of the, the interview because I was in Torino and yeah. when I met Paolo Pininfarina and it was like uh, 38 degrees and 80% humidity. So it's, it's a pure coincidence that after the 23rd, uh, I could not, uh, and Filiberto could not survive any longer. So we stopped, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, so Bruce, regarding the question, uh, if you still remember it, can you tackle that one? Sure. Uh, I mean, for me, the the um, the idea of of boundaries and crisp lines between disciplines um, is really um, less and less plausible. That um, you can see in almost everything that we're doing, um, like you suggest, uh, that we are you know we are putting things together in new ways. Uh, combining things, uh, hybridizing, synthesizing, um, and ultimately, um, I think what the what the Nexus as a project really proposes is that it's the synthesis that is really the 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 kind of skill and talent of the future uh, that we're going to need to develop. That ultimately, we need to solve the kinds of problems that we had. Um, and if you think about, um, you know, the, the, the way that we approached the problems was that we extracted the problem like an object 
from its context. Um, and then applied design to that kind of falsely singular thing, uh, Im imagining that you could kind of take it out of context. Uh, and then, you know, once we had a one-to-one -one problem solution uh, equation developed, we put it back into context. Uh, and of course, it produced all kinds of new problems. Um, you know, we solved that one, but it, it, it produced the ecosystem problems that we now have today. Um, and the idea that, that the ecosystem problems are going to be solved by old category solutions uh, is really not plausible. You know, when, when, um, you know, when I talk to Julio about life-centered design, which is really the practice that we're kind of dedicated to in developing, um, his response is su such a clear articulation was, you're not going to solve climate change with human-centered design. Right? Yeah. Like when you think about the, if we're obsessed with the, with the human experience, we miss the big picture. We miss the big lens. Um, and Julio has, you know, I think his kind of uh, metaphor of the big, you know, the, seeing the big picture, seeing the big lens, um, and really beginning to kind of synthesize at that level, is for me what what it, what that really is about. And that means blurring the bounds and blurring the categories to really create new kinds of practices. Um, and that's that's where we're gonna, that's where I think the kind of great opportunity is. Um, and so for me, you know, when I begin to think about that, I think, well, where are the people who already do this? You know, who are the people who naturally do it? And so we look at um, cinema. Cinema is a practice of synthesis and blurring that, you know, almost like nothing else. I mean, we have literally, you know, you look at it, at the credits for a big, big production and it's you know sometimes hundreds even thousands of people um, and you but you have you have a kind of synthesis of all of that into a clear beautiful coherent singular experience and you can kind of make that the you know, make that happen and similarly in architecture that in architecture you have you know hundreds of inputs to generate one coherent output um, and I think that practice of synthesis is really the, what, you know, I mean, for me, that's the future of design. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it Those makes sense. Uh, but uh, here comes the challenge from our perspective where uh, what we observe is the also blurification of industries and boundaries between industries with the uh, competition came coming from uh, traditionally non-adjacent sectors. You know, mm -hmm. le let's talk about an example. If you think about self-driving cars and automotive, uh, besides the fact that you know, in the in the in that context, the traditional automotive players are basically seeing uh, uh, competition coming from all directions. There is also a component of Healthcare as an automotive uh, platform right now. Uh, um, travel and lodging as an automotive platform right now, where the uh, travel industry and the hotel industry is thinking of adding, uh, you know, uh, self-driving cars as part of the experience to uh, improve the relationship with the, the customers and so on and so forth. All possible futures, of course. Mm -hmm. So in that context, uh, uh, a lot of industry players are concerned about margins and making money and uh, how they're, you know, how they see potential big cakes in their future, but how they see their actually current cake shrinking. So how do we inspire them? How do we get them? to also deal with the bigger problem and the bigger elephant in the room uh, when uh, uh, they are concerned with the reshaping of the industry and then having most of them hard time understanding what's going on. So mm -hmm. how do we drive them to do the change that they need to do uh, in the direction 
we want them to go in that sense. So in the in the book, we have the picture of two motorcycles from Harley Davidson, one 1912 that has one cylinder and a leather belt. And we put the 1913 because in that year they went to two cylinders and a chain belt. And that second picture is the one that carried Harley Davidson until maybe five, six years ago, okay? But at some point you have to be aware that all the experience and knowledge that you accumulated in even fine tuning the sound of, because Harley Davidson was about the experience. They were selling an experience. At some point, nothing of that matters when it's clear that e-bikes are coming in to the horizon. And I think even though there's only one Harley Davidson, almost every other company has to have an example like that clear in front of their eyes because almost everything at some point will be disrupted, okay? Well, and the it, sooner, sorry? No, in the book you mention uh, the, the name of the, I think uh, uh, the, the inventor and business leader of a Polaroid at some point, uh, and uh, there used to be only one Polaroid uh, or there used to yeah, be Polaroid yeah, as yeah, the leader. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's a little yeah. bit the same uh, that uh, technological uh, innovation uh, is uh, disruptive of categories. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Almost yeah. Automatically. The case of Edwin Land is, uh, we, don't, we didn't put this in the book. Edwin Land in his time was more famous than Steve Jobs ever was. Exactly. He was advising yeah. presidents and so on and so forth in the middle of the Cold War. And the question during that time was how to get the pictures that the U-2 planes were shooting over Russia. And this was declassified recently. Uh, people think that Edwin Land never wanted to go beyond what is basically a chemical process is to produce film like in Polaroid. But he was one of the few people advocating in this circle of advisors to the president about digital technology. And this was in, in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, and he was advocating this privately, but he never changed that in Polaroid itself. So, yeah. uh, but that's a clear, case of a uh, transition. Everything that you have accumulated in knowledge on how to polish lenses, uh, even if you are in classical photography, uh, pr producing Hasselblads and whatever famous camera was there made in Germany, nothing of that helped you when the transition went to digital. So I think no matter where you are, even in science, I think you have to be prepared that at some point people will say, you know what? We heard enough about you going in this direction. We need to go in another one. And this, the, the, the sooner you kind of get prepared for this seismic change of, of uh, that awaits to all of us, the, the better you will be prepared to deal with it. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, I, I think you know if you follow that line, uh, you get to Kodak, and the the digital camera was actually invented at Kodak, uh, and the inventor um, made a demonstration. He patched together this kind of prototype, um, and he showed that you could make images and show them on a television, um, and he did some two hundred presentations within the company including to the board. And the people at the board level said, who wants their pictures on the TV? <laughs> and, and they invented the thing that killed them. 
I mean, it's it's really uh, you know an, an incredible story of what you know how this kind of um, inevitable disruption uh, yeah. and this kind of change of scale, right? Because they thought it was ugly, and it's a really you know it's a it's a kind of classic nexus problem. They thought it was ugly. Um, they thought it wasn't who, who would want that when they could have Kodachrome. So there are there are two examples that come more from the science side of things. So in the past, a, a chemist of first rank, a really respected chemist, was the one who could imagine a molecule, imagine what properties it would have, and then find a way of making the molecule, OK? And then something happens that was completely inelegant and was what is called combinatorial chemistry, OK? That you have a process in which you produce, in one shot, a thousand variations on that molecule. And the idea is one of them has to be good, OK? In the same way that the people who are working on artificial intelligence in the 60s and 70s, what these people wanted to find was the algebra of thought, the, the, the elementary building blocks that can uh, produce human consciousness. Okay. And for these people, all of these things about machine learning is inelegant. It's just brute force. It's, it, it, it's like producing paintings by variations on a computer. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you have to be prepared for this. It may not be elegant, but it's inevitable. And at some point, you have to kind of uh, accept reality. And maybe we always lean, you always need the kind of odd duck pursuing something that doesn't go in the mainstream, okay? But the question is how many acolytes you can have if you have some way of thinking that is completely orthogonal to the way that everybody thinks. And so those two are coming more from science. There are very few people now, uh, chemists like they were in 1950s and clearly almost everything now about machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence is, is not like what we people imagine in 1960 and 70, in which but people who are working at that point involve people with degrees in philosophy, for example. I don't know where those people are, but the massive change that took place moved more in the direction of what those guys would have called brute force. Um, so how do we, and I understand the examples, uh, and uh, in a way it seems to me that uh, CEOs and leadership in companies are more scared about this Kodak slash blockbuster scenario uh, than they are though about climate change. Because mm -hmm. a lot of them are really pretending to do something about it. So how do we, how do, can the Nexus really help uh, making uh, uh, this uh, landmark uh, change uh, uh, for companies? I think one of the ways is to show, and it's one of the things we do in the book, is, is to show the impact of what happens when you really you know, when you really think at the nexus, um, if you take the work of um, of Apple or Pixar or Disney, uh, these are nexus companies. Um, and you know, if you take a company like Apple and you take beauty out of it, you would be left with a reasonably good technology company that you've never heard of and would have accomplished very little and really changed nothing. But when you put beauty into it, the way that Jobs really did, he understood he was, you know, intuitively a Nexus person. 
um, he understood that uh, that design was really the kind of methodology that would change things. Uh, and he synthesized that and produced Apple. And you create the most valuable country, most valuable company in the in the history of the world. Um, and I think the fact that business leaders don't see that and copy it <laughs> is for me uh, really shocking that you know that you have to explain it um, when it's so obvious that that you know there's a reason that they put designed in California on their products uh, because where it's manufactured is inconsequential but the design culture in the same way that Florence produced uh, the Renaissance uh, the culture of the of the design place really produces the effect and produces a nexus culture capable of changing the world. And that's really what, you know, that's really what happened. But uh, so uh, one, in, oh, sorry, sorry, please. No, one thing that we mentioned very much in passing in the book, and this is based on conversations I had with a friend who is in marketing here, is when at some moment in the past or now, a company manages to fuse two things that normally go in separate ways, like engineering excellence and raw emotion, okay? But that's what Ferrari was able to do. Uh, how they will manage this going to electric cars, God knows. But the idea that you can have two things that people in their minds intertwine, but in most cases are separate, uh, there are many instances where this can happen. Um, in some cases, you will probably hide one because you want the image. For example, I, I think we mentioned in the book a company who has the most amount of data about everything and probably really bad marketing is Facebook, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's all analytical and not emotionally driven. But then there are companies that they look completely emotionally driven, like many luxury companies, uh, the ones under Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, they clearly have the analytical part backing them up, but they hide the analytical part because what they are selling is all the creative part. So uh, I think if you look under the hood, you'll find many cases in which these two things are intertwined. In some cases, visibly, like in the Ferrari case, in other cases, hiding one more part because it's not part of who they project they are, but you need both parts. Which, uh, by the way, one thing that we, we talk in the book, and it was in reference to what um, Bruce was telling us about extracting a problem and solving it, but losing the context. Uh, something that we, at least in conversations, we always say clearly is that there is no big price for solving correctly what turns out to be the wrong question. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very common instance of over analytical thinking and trying to use tools too quickly because you make the problem conform to something that you have seen before. But in doing that, you lose all the context that made the problem complex. A really good that's a really good point and you know we have um we've developed what we call a product agnostic practice in other words we don't start with the solution being something that we know you know so if you ask an architect what the solution is to a problem the solution will be a building a product designer will say the solution is a product and the graphic designer will tell you the solution is graphic design. Uh, whereas if you simply say we're product agnostic, you know, let's look at the problem and allow the problem to synthesize the solution, to produce the solution that we need. Um, if you can keep that discipline, 
And it really goes back to the blur that you were talking about. We don't we don't start knowing that the problem that the solution to the problem is going to be a specific kind of object. We say, let's look at the problem holistically and especially ecologically, you know, from a from a complex contextual ecosystem to try to understand what really is happening. Uh, that will lead us to the solution. And it may be, you know, I mean, it may be nothing at all, actually. You know, I've worked on projects where the answer was to do nothing. And, yeah. you know, the, the client, the client didn't Most expect it. Most notably the MoMA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The client didn't expect it. Uh, but, but sometimes that is the right one. You know, that is the, the answer. But that only is, a, a, that's only allowable in a in a nexus world where you can actually focus really on the synthesis and not on the object. Well, I, we you you brought uh, uh, a lot of uh, of Italy uh, from from where Filiberto and I are. You, you brought Ferrari, Brunelleschi, uh, Florence, the Renaissance. Uh, and I would like to do something a bit unconventional uh, to uh, wrap up the interview. This is a, a book. Uh, it's normally not advisable to show a, a book uh, when you are launching a book. But this is a book I wrote a review about uh, a couple of years ago. It's mm -hmm. called Past Futures, a Science and Fiction, Space and Travel and Post-War Art of the Americas. And basically, uh, it's based on a show curated by Sarah J. Montrose. Um, it's covering uh, uh, Southern American, Latin American, uh, art uh, about uh, the future and space in the 1960s. And it has uh, uh, at one page, uh, this uh, 1968 poster of a show, Los Argentinos <laughs> and La Luna, Argentinians yeah. on, the, on the moon. And yeah. uh, I wrote a book review <laughs> about this, uh, this uh, project. And uh, this is a 1968 uh, collective exhibition in 1970. The Argentinian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale was all about uh, uh, chemistry, biology, and uh, the future. And I made a comment uh, that 1968 uh, was yeah. just before the very tough uh, 1970s uh, in Argentina. But still, uh, the Argentinians uh, were uh, radically optimistic. Yeah. Uh, and they were dreaming of going conquering the, the moon uh, as Argentinians. Now, my question would be uh, just uh, a, in, a, in a, like uh, perhaps in a uh, sort of elevator pitch, but how will the Nexus uh, embody this radical optimism to bring uh, not only the Argentinians, but all, us all to a preferable future, which is not going to be the moon because in the meantime, we conquered it. But how will the Nexus uh, bring us forward from the point of view of radical optimism, which is uh, the, the characteristic, one of the characteristic of Bruce, uh, Bruce's uh, practice and work. Bruce, you want to, that's your specialty. <laughs> oh, optimism. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it is, it is, um, you know, I, I hadn't really thought this through, but now that you've mentioned it, I think Nexus does demand optimism. You know, it demands the belief that we we will be able to synthesize uh, and bring these worlds together. Um, so it starts from the premise that you that, that we will have the capacity to do that, even though the the worlds themselves and we you know Julio really kind of maps it out beautifully in the book. Um, the worlds themselves are becoming more and more um, complex, demanding, and challenging. Uh, and and scaling at a you know at an exponential pace that makes that synthesis more challenging. Uh, but you know the the belief in the nexus is a belief in possibility, yeah. uh, and in the human imagination. And also, um, even though cases are singular, and there is always some drawback to every case. Okay, at some moments in the past, even if briefly, uh, I wouldn't say humanity, but a few people 
were able to come together and produce outputs that could have been inconceivable if these people were separate. So we pick a couple of examples in there. Uh, some of them lasted only for 14 years, like the Bauhaus, where it's still kind of living with consequences of those 14 years. Uh, other ones, not so well known by, you know this, but many people would not, Black Mountain College, for example. But I think the, this confluence of talents merging together in a new hole, the expectation is that they will keep occurring. And so if I'm optimistic, is on the belief that those things will happen and we'll be able to tackle problems that we think are impossible to solve now, but it's just based on human record of being able to repeat the things that uh, I, my optimism is based. Well, thank you so much, uh, Julio Mario. Um, and uh, thank you, Bruce, of course. Uh, uh, the Nexus uh, is just out with uh, MIT Press. Uh, there are uh, uh, five uh, uh, online posters that are uh, micro cult uh, uh, digital objects uh, that uh, capture uh, some of the key messages of, uh, of the Nexus. There is uh, a sort of newsletter with press and uh, with mm -hmm. uh, audio contributions. Uh, which is uh, all available. Uh, I think it's uh, just like every book where, uh, where Bruce has been involved, it's going to be a milestone and it's going to be, I remember uh, that the book with Rem Collas was the Bible of uh, the desktop, desktop revolution uh, on, on the desk of every uh, graphic designer of, of the time and it will surely uh, carry forward the, uh, the vision and the mission. Mm -hmm. um, Filberto, would you like to wrap up? No, I just wanted to, you know, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it's been really a, a pleasure and an honor uh, having you with us today, talking about the Nexus. Uh, very inspiring conversation. Uh, I wish you all the best with the, with the book and uh, uh, keep us in mind in the future. Uh, we would love to have the opportunity to chat with you again. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. And Thank next so week much. we are we are going to have uh, as our uh, uh, guest uh, Busy Williams, and we are going to extend uh, the discussion and the dialogue about the Massive Change Network, uh, uh, the Mao documentary, and some of the ideas we shared today uh, with uh, Busy Williams uh, just in one week from now. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce Mao, uh, Julio Mario Tino. And uh, thank you, and uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much. Arrivederci. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Arrivederci. Ciao.